Uh, let me just put my timer and welcome every, everyone. Thank you a lot for coming. This talk will be about NoSQL injection and how to exploit them to obtain an applicative dose. And I've decided to subtitle the talk How to Find Exploits by Reading the Doc. Because you will find that just by having a hacky mind when reading the doc, you can actually find exploits and create new attacks against applications. So my name is Vladimir de Turkheim. You can call me Vlad. I'm the lead Node.js guy at Screen with a security company. So maybe you want to talk about that with me. But I'm also part of the Node.js security working group, and I'm a Node.js collaborator. So if you've got questions regarding Node.js security, feel free to ping the working group, Lewin's here, Michael there, or me. And we are hiring a screen, so if you want to move to Paris, we relocate you, and that's cool. But let's go through serious business right now. So just a quick poll. Who in the room is already familiar with SQL injections? Yeah, pretty much everyone. So I will go quickly on the first part, because the first part is mostly reminders about SQL injection. Then I will explain how to obtain no SQL injections. And I have a confession to make. So you all come to see problem in NoSQL databases. We will only focus on MongoDB. So sorry for the scam, I guess. But after the first introductory part, we'll go to the serious business, as known as the cool part, because we will exploit a MongoDB injection to break application, and that's fun. And of course, because I'm a serious person, I will teach you how to protect yourself against that, because I'm not unconscious. Please don't do evil. So let's start right away with SQL injection and no SQL injections. So as most of you are already familiar with SQL injection, I won't spend too much time on that. So let's check this piece of code. That's an express controller that accepts get request on a URL that ends up with slash post slash ID, and ID being a parameter. And when there is a request that gets into the application, we create a SQL query, select star from items where IT equals, and then we put the parameter, and we run that on the database. So as a result, if the ID in the HTTP request is one, the query becomes select star from items where ID equals one. And the outcome of that is eventually the document which has an ID one in this table, if it exists. And I realized that the name item is terrible for a database table, so I try to do better next time. But as most of you saw, it is injectable, meaning it's terrible. Um, so if instead of an integer, I put one or true, the SQL query becomes select star from items where ID equals one or true, right? And at this point, every documents in that table are returned as a result of the HTTP request, and that's called a data leak. And if you don't think that's a big deal, just ask Yahoo, because it almost kills them recently, a couple of years ago. And obviously, we can do even more eviler stuff. Is that a word, eviler? We can be more, more evil than that with using an union query to hit another table. So you can do one union select username password from users. So the SQL query becomes select star from items where ID equals one union select username password from users. And since I'm a terrible developer when I created this app, the passwords are not even hashed. So basically that's a backdoor to everything in my app and I should feel bad, but not as bad as those people who all have been having SQL injections in production in the last four or three years. And please don't sue me, I check the slides each time I do the presentation, and there is a reference at the bottom of the page, so please sue the guy who writes this website if you disagree with that. And most people tell me SQL injection are things of the past. You know, now we've got ORMs, we've got big frameworks, and we don't have SQL injections anymore, right? Yeah, I'm not sure Instagram has legacy code in their code base, so I'm not sure SQL injection are really legacy attacks. So long story short, you want to care about them. But that's not the topic of the talk, because I hear someone in the room being like, yeah, he spends too much time talking about SQL injections. I want to hear about MongoDB. And you're totally right. But before I talk about MongoDB injection, maybe we should remember all together how MongoDB works compared to, compared to SQL databases. So in MongoDB, you don't have a single string to formalize your query. 
you've got what's called a collection, which is more or less the equivalent of a SQL table. And then you've got a method, you call on that collection, and then you've got a query object that describes what the method should do. So in that example, we want to go, th we want to go through a collection named items. Once again, it's a terrible name. And we want to operate the method named find that obviously allows you to find documents in a collection. And since we don't want to find all the documents in the collection, we use a query object. So this can be, for instance, amount zero. And the outcome of this request will be getting all the items in that collection, which have a field name amount, that is the integer zero. And it will be extremely limited if the only request you could do is I want something that has a value with that value. Uh, it has a field with that value. So MongoDB has a query language, uh, query language. Uh, as you can see on the last line of this slide, you can use, for instance, $JT for greater than, which is obvious. No, I, I, I feel like this language is the most cryptic one in the world and isn't understandable for anyone. But in that case, if we want every document which has a field amount whose value is greater than zero and not equal to, you, we can use $JT0. And of course, there are a lot of other operators like EQ for equals, and NIN for not in. And you can see that exists I'm not sure what it does. It seems way too straightforward to be fair. And you've got other methods to do stuff on your database because you could also insert document, remove document, or update documents. And I think the GIF is telling me that this slide is boring as heck, so I should move forward at this point. So who knows about NoSQL injection in the room? All right, so you come to the right talk because I will show you how to perform that. So we've got another express controller. This time it's a post route. We'll see later that you can do the same with a get route, but let's start with an easy one. And we've got a Mongo query. It's made with Mongoose, so Mongoose does not protect you against that. We've got a Mongo query that's document.find. And then the query is created based on the content of the HTTP payload. So it's type, and then we take the field desired type in the HTTP payload, right? So let's say I want to fetch all the documents that have the type blog in my collection. So my request.body would be desired type blog, the string blog. And the query becomes document.find type blog. At this point, it's most straight, mostly straightforward because the outcome of this request is all the documents in the collection that has a field named type, which value exactly is blog. And what our developer did not think through when he did that is that, hey, there is no thing to prevent anyone from injecting an arbitrary object in that controller. So if an attacker would just craft a curl request and put desired type not equal zero, zero, the query becomes document.find type not equal zero. And since in this collection we can assume perfectly that the type is always a string, this will return all the documents which have a field type or not that is not equal to zero, basically everything. So once again, we've got a massive data leak, and let's ask all the company who got bankrupt because of that kind of attack how they feel about that. Yeah, I'm a mean person, I know. So now we will talk a bit about denial of service and MongoDB, because I've showed you that MongoDB injection can be dangerous. It's mostly dangerous for a data leak, but if you can inject a delete statement, an update statement, it can be even worse because you could remove arbitrary data from the database or update arbitrary documents in the database. But now I will show, I will demonstrate to obtain an, appli an applicative denial of service. But before showing you how to get an applicative denial of service, maybe I should talk about what is a denial of service. So it's a very fun attack because everything is in the name. So let's say you have a website. And at, in, at one point, it's not giving service to your legitimate users. Like you're, you have a chat application, and people cannot chat anymore. You are in a, in a situation where service is denied to your users. So you are in a situation of denial of service. So the question is, how can a, a bad, malicious attacker 
put an application into its state. So you've got the very famous DDoS attacks that were extremely popular a few years ago, and that's basically a caveman attack. It's basically hitting an application so hard and so often that it stops responding. So to do that, you can, for instance, have 1,000 of billions of, uh, of, uh, of machines that do HTTP requests, a lot of them at the same time on the same endpoint. And the CPU will get higher, the heap will explode, and at one point, your application will crash and will not respond to anyone. And don't say I, say I told that, but you can use Loic for that. It's a fun tool. And you can have also have other network-based denial of service. If you uh, trick like times out in TCP stack, that's really fun to do, and there is awesome literature about that. If you want to know more, ping me about that. And in the Node.js world, we also have the regex denial of service. So a Node application is monothreaded, right? Meaning that if you do something synchronous like forever, the application cannot do anything else. At this point, you're blocking the event loop. And regex are a really fun way to obtain that. So I, I have a client of mine who actually uh, regexed those themselves because they were having a malicious regex, not a malicious, but a poorly crafted regex in their app. And with a huge payload at one point, the regex took seconds to execute. So it's not a permanent denial of service because your app is not crashing. But for all the time of the regex, is uh, computing, your application is not responding anymore. And that's pretty bad because it costs you money because you have to scale and sometimes you, you get up to your scale limit and you cannot do anything anymore and your business is bankrupt in 20 hours. But what else? What else can we do to obtain a, re a denial of service? So to be honest, I was trying to obtain regex dose in MongoDB. Because MongoDB has a regex operator, right? That allows you to search document based on a regex. And I failed miserably because there is a protection in MongoDB for that. So, hey. But then I was browsing the doc and I saw this code sample. And at once the light came to me. Because there is this parameter when you use the MongoDB driver pool size. And I was like, wait, what? If there's a pool size, that means there is a connection pool from your application, from your Node.js process, to the MongoDB database. And if you go through MongoDB documentation, you learn that there is only one Mongo query uh, in, the, in each connection in the pool at a time. Meaning if you've got five uh, connection in your pool, connections in your pool, you can only perform five queries to MongoDB at the same time. So the new one will have to wait for the other ones to finish. And I think people, you, you can see where I'm going there. So I was looking at that a lot. I, I actually spent a few hours looking at this chunk of code and was like, can we exhaust the pool size? I mean, if I am able to have five very slow requests at the same time in parallel from my application to MongoDB, then there wouldn't be any connection left for the legitimate traffic. And the application will not be responding on the endpoints that needs MongoDB. Basically, all of them, if you use MongoDB as your, as your primary database. So then I did what every hacker should do. I went back to MongoDB doc. Because MongoDB doc showed me something extremely interesting once again, is that the dollar where operator. The dollar where operator allows you to run arbitrary JavaScript on MongoDB side. So it's cool when you've got a complex query to perform, you can have an arbitrary expression that returns a Boolean, and this, uh, this JavaScript code will run against each element in the collection, one by one, and return all the elements that returns truth against that expression. And MongoDB, I don't know why, has a sleep method in its standard JavaScript lib. Meaning that if you type sleep with a parameter in your Mongo shell or in a Mongo query, you will wait for this number of milliseconds. I'm not sure what it's for because often MongoDB is already slow by itself. But if you want to add slowness artificially, be my guest and do it. And now, let's see how to 
take that all together to perform an applicative DOS. So at the beginning of the talk, I said that items was boring as a collection name, so basically now we'll use dogs. Um, dogs is a really important choice because there are two kinds of people on Earth, uh, murderers and people who like dogs. So I hope everyone is on the right side here. And this endpoint basically allows you to fetch a dog uh, by its name. Let's see how that works. So that's a get endpoint because we'll have the query based on the query string here. And when we've got a request, we do dog.find and then we take the HTTP query string and we return the result of that command. But this time, we will not focus on the injection. So as you can see at the, on the second half of the slide, the, the, outla the outcome is a bit different as usual. So we've got a line named AB. AB is a tool named Apache Bench that allows you basically to perform load testing on an application. It allows you to run a lot of HTTP requests in a small amount of time against an application. So AB will be impersonating our attacker, the attacker that wants to exhaust the pool size, who wants to make the application unresponsive. So AB is the bad part in our scenario. And the query is the query performed by AB and the curl. And at the bottom, we've got time curl. Time curl represents the legitimate users, meaning to perform this test, we run the AB command to have an attack flow happening against the app. And then be, during the attack flow, we run a curl command that represents the legitimate traffic. And we measure the time it takes to answer to that curl command. And the goal of this game is to make this curl command as inefficient as possible, as slow as possible. So let's start with a not that bad attack. So we'll perform 10 HTTP requests in parallel, up to 100 of them without any special injection. So in that case, the good legitimate traffic takes two seconds to be performed, which is already terrible, but that's because my code is terrible. And because there is 10,000 documents in the collection we have to return in that query, that's why it takes time. So we do that, and we see that that's the, the legitimate user get access to the service, so there is no denial of service at this point. Now let's see what happens if we fetch only one dog, so I can show you how the query actually performs. So I fetch one dog by its name with a query string, so I chose the dog named Luzu because Luzu is the best name for a dog. Yeah, it, it was my, the name of my dog when I grew up as a boy, so you don't care, but I do. Uh, you can see her on the right, left-hand side of the picture, of the slide. But so let's say we fetch only one dog at once. So we've got our attacks, again, the AB part, and we've got our witness legitimate traffic as the last line, the curl comment. And this time, since we are only fetching one record over 10,000, because there is only one loser in the universe, uh, it's much faster. It takes 600 milliseconds to perform the legitimate traffic, which is somehow all right. And now let's do the fun thing. Let's inject that. So instead of having a query in the form name and a legitimate doc name, we'll have a query in the form dollar where and sleep one, which means for each document in that collection, we'll ask MongoDB to pause its execution for one millisecond. And I started this test suit with my usual setup, and it took time. It took a lot of time. I mean, it, it was never stopping. So at one point, I just interrupted the treatment, and the two minutes it took for the uh, legitimate call is actually the time after which I stopped the treatment. Meaning that until I was stopping the attack part, the legitimate user were not having any access to the application at all, altogether. So we actually performed a denial of service through a MongoDB injection on a Node.js app. And it's not only working for Node.js apps, because NoSQL injections are available in all applications. Uh, we protect that in Java, PHP, Python, and we see that in real life in all these languages. Meaning that this attack is not tied to Node.js. If you've got backends in other technologies, you might want to check if you're vulnerable to that. And sorry for the anxiety I created in the room. That's not my goal. But 
yeah, app is not responding, we managed to get what we wanted. But the real question, because we are at a dev conference, we are not at a black hat conference, is how do we protect against that? So you've got the bad way to protect against that. Some people told me, hey, you just have to expand the pool size. Yeah, but you know, the pool size by default is five. You expand it to 10, we will just have to do 10 requests in parallel to flood it. You will expand to 100, we will do 100 requests in parallel to flood it. I mean, having a lot of HTTP requests hitting an application is not expensive, especially now that everyone can spawn a lot of, of uh, machines in the cloud within seconds. So don't think that it is a power game because you cannot win. You will rate limit. Maybe you can rate limit access to your application, but sometimes some endpoints in your application are slower than other. And sometimes you don't, some endpoint in your application needs to be called more than other. So how will you rate limit? Except if you've got a single endpoint application, rate, limi rate limiting is not really a good strategy because it will create a bad developer experience for your team and a bad user experience for your clients. So you should not go that way either. So maybe we should prevent no SQL injection altogether. Maybe as half of the security talk in the world, the conclusion is don't trust the external inputs in your app. So validate everything that goes into your app and be extremely conservative with that. Don't accept anything you don't know the shape of. So if you're a cool kid, you're basically using Happy as a framework, and there's already something in line into Happy uh, to do that. If you're using Express, you can use Joy, which is a very cool library from the Happy project, and there is a middleware generator named Celebrate to use with Joy. And that's a very, very easy to use pattern matching library that allows you to uh, validate everything that gets into your application without a lot of pain. So you might have fun with that. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I have a favor to ask you. Please scan this QR code or go to this URL and provide me feedback about this talk. That's really important so I can expand. Feel free to ping me, and if you want to talk node security or application security, feel free to contact me.